Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? Okay, I, we've, got a, we've got a crowd full of youth here, so I just want to hear it a little bit louder. How's everyone doing this morning? All right, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for coming. Welcome to the White House and welcome to today's State of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math event. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the President's State of the Union address last night, the aspects of that speech that relate to science, technology, and innovation, and we're very excited to have you with us here today. Um, students in the audience, we're excited to hear your questions for our administration speakers and special guests. Um, to get it started, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the President's top advisor for science, um, Dr. John Holdren. Well, thank you very much, Bess, and thanks to all of you for being here and welcome to the White House. Um, it is a, a particular pleasure as President Obama's science advisor to welcome uh, this group and kick off what is the first ever State of STEM event immediately following the President's State of the Union speech. Uh, I hope a lot of you heard it. Uh, in that State of the Union speech, one of the things he referenced and a topic that he's emphasized since he first took office is the uh, importance, the enormous importance of science, technology, engineering, and math and innovations based on those disciplines for our nation's future. The fact is that much of the growth and much of the success of this nation since its founding has been built on advances in science, technology, engineering, and math and innovations arising from them. That was uh, even more true in the 20th century than in the previous one, and it will be even more true in the 21st century than it was in the 20th. And the uh, result of the President's recognition of the extraordinary importance of STEM for our country's present and for its future is that we have spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of thought, a lot of resources trying to shore up, strengthen the foundations of capacity in science, technology, engineering, and math and innovation in this country. And those sources of capacity, of course, include our investments in basic research. They include the quality of our education in science, technology, engineering, and math from preschool to grad school and beyond, as the President himself has said. Some of the celebration of success in this domain that we have engaged in has included welcoming to the White House Nobel Prize winners, successful inventors, CEOs of high-tech companies, astronauts, world-renowned scientists from every corner of the globe, uh, and in fact the chairs you are sitting in right now have previously been sat in by folks in all of those categories, some of the leaders of this country's and the world's science and technology and innovation communities. But in many ways, you are the most important set of innovators to sit in these chairs because you are the future of STEM in this country. You are tomorrow's patent holders, problem solvers, app developers, engineers, explorers of everything from sea to air to space, you, more than anybody, are representative of the folks who are at the core of President Obama's vision for the future of STEM in America, because you are the people who can and will turn that vision into reality. As the President has said repeatedly, science, technology, and innovation are not just helpful, but they are absolutely essential to meeting every one of the major challenges this country faces from growing the economy and creating jobs, to protecting ourselves from natural and man-made disasters, to creating an environment in which Americans can live longer, healthier lives, to addressing big challenges like the intersection of energy and climate change. Not to mention, of course, all kinds of super exciting stuff, like Monday's spectacular launch of a new Earth-observing satellite atop an Atlas V rocket, uh, or our plans to visit an asteroid, to actually take U.S. astronauts uh, to uh, an asteroid, never happened before. Uh, in fact, U.S. astronauts have never gone beyond uh, the moon, but we will go beyond the moon, and ultimately we will go to Mars. Um, every one of these goals has at its core some big, big challenges. Sometimes we call them grand challenges. 
But where others see difficulties as daunting mountains, obstacles, scientists and engineers see possibilities that with the right tools and the right know-how can become game-changing solutions. Now, this is not the first time we've invited students to the White House to talk about STEM. As you may know, the President has hosted not one but two science fairs at the White House, something no President has ever done before. Those science fairs have invited the winners of competitions in science, engineering, math, robotics uh, from around the country to come and present their winning demonstrations, their projects, their solutions, their poster boards. And at each one of those, the President has gotten down and dirty with the kids in their demonstrations. He's crawled around on the floor with the robots. He's fired the marshmallow cannon. Um, he has uh, flustered his schedulers each time by spending vastly more time with the students in their projects than his schedulers had allowed, causing various dignitaries, diplomats, and excellencies to cool their heels waiting for him because he fell so far behind schedule in his enthusiasm for being with kids who are interested in STEM and talking about their discoveries and their excitement. If any of you have surfed the White House uh, YouTube channel, you may even have seen a uh, video of uh, the President pulling the trigger on the marshmallow cannon. Uh, I have to tell you the Secret Service was not happy about that. They don't like cannons in the White House. Uh, they don't even like robots that pick things up and throw them, as was demonstrated in this room uh, a couple of years ago when the President was standing at this podium. And right in front here were kids who had built a robot in a competition that involved picking up a large rock-sized object and throwing it into a bin. It was to replicate a robot on the moon collecting samples. And it was like a three-hour argument with the Secret Service before they would allow this catapult to operate in the presence of the President of the United States. But we won that argument, and, 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 and we almost always win the argument when it comes to getting the President close and uh, engage uh, with students uh, working on STEM uh, topics. Um, obviously, uh, we need to keep that momentum going, and we plan to keep it going. And that is where uh, you and your dedicated teachers, your supportive parents, your committed uh, mentors uh, come in. Uh, you're the ones who are going to keep America innovating toward discoveries that we can't even dream about today. You're the ones who are going to find solutions to some of the world's most important problems. So we wanted to give you a chance to talk to us. And by us, I mean a number of the people uh, in and around the Obama administration who are supporting our initiatives in STEM fields. Uh, including uh, from the private sector who are doing uh, their share as well. So I want to introduce you to our star lineup here, and then I'm going to turn this over to you, the students. Uh, we might take some questions from your teachers as well, but it's mostly about the students, um, to tell us what's on your mind, what you care about, and uh, what questions you'd like uh, our folks to answer. Uh, you can direct those questions, by the way, to an individual, or you can just ask me as moderator, and I will try to uh, direct your question to the most appropriate uh, respondents. So let me uh, introduce uh, the panel, starting on my far left, uh, Todd Park. He is the nation's chief technology officer. It's the first time in history that we have had a chief technology officer for the nation in this uh, administration. Uh, Todd is a total data geek who is making sure that we're making the best use of data to spur innovation and economic growth and a higher quality of life for all Americans. Lori Garver uh, is the Deputy Administrator of NASA and has overseen a simply remarkable array of missions into space uh, over the past several years, as well as very important work in the domain of technology development, habitation in space, Earth observation for environmental and weather monitoring. Lori is a fabulous partner uh, for those of us in the White House. Uh, in the many important domains of space. Uh, Peter Hudson, I got them slightly, slightly out of order there. The chair arrangement was different than my notes arrangement. I apologize. Peter Hudson, uh, a physician by training. Peter is the co-founder and CEO of iTriage, a startup company that has designed apps to help consumers find the best doctors and hospitals and other healthcare resources uh, for their needs, all based on data of the sort that Todd Park is making sure everybody has available to use. Uh, Jack Andreka, just to the right of Lori Garver, is a high school sophomore. Uh, <clears throat> I know some of you in the audience can identify with that. He is also the most recent winner 
of the uh, Intel International Science and Engineering Fair for his creation of a new method to detect early stage pancreatic cancer. And I have to say that when I was doing science fairs as a kid, you know, we were doing baking soda volcanoes and things like that. Um, it's clear that science fairs have come uh, a long way uh, since then, and congratulations uh, to Jack Andreka for uh, an absolutely extraordinary thing for, uh, for somebody so early in his STEM career to have discovered and developed. And finally, Bob Back Ferdowski, better known to the public as NASA's Mohawk guy, uh, a flight director for the NASA Mars Science Laboratory mission uh, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that successfully landed the Curiosity rover on Mars this past summer. I had the privilege of, uh, of being in the, uh, in the building uh, and, uh, and watching that happen. And, uh, and, and marveling at the focus and dedication of all of the folks in the control room, uh, including not least the Mohawk guy, and we're very happy uh, to have him uh, with us. So uh, just to get started, I'm going to uh, ask the first question. I'll ask it of Todd Park. Uh, Todd, what got you so interested in uh, STEM in the first place? And is it true that you think data and apps are beautiful? <laughs> uh. Guilty, absolutely believe that data and apps are beautiful. I mean, what got me interested in STEM to begin with is I'm sure what got a lot of people in this room interested in STEM, which is that, uh, you know, it was just an incredible way to understand the truth of how the universe works. Uh, but what's actually truly uh, caused me to fall head over heels madly, passionately in love with STEM is something beyond that, which is I've actually learned that STEM is something you can use to actually do incredible things, unearthly things like send a giant nuclear-powered robot to another planet, right? Or invent a new way to fight cancer. Or build an app that's literally saving lives. You'll hear more about that from the panel here. But the whole notion of STEM, not just as a way to understand the universe, but to build things and do things that advance human good in almost unimaginable ways, that to me is really the magic of STEM and why I'm just head over heels passionately in a lifelong romantic relationship with it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now let's give the audience uh, a chance uh, to ask questions. And again, priority goes to students here. Uh, Bess has a microphone. If you raise your hand, uh, she can come over to you uh, with the microphone so that you can be heard. And I'd like to ask that uh, you give your, your name and where you come from uh, as you start your question. Come on, this has got to be a livelier group than that. Okay, over here. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Kurt Fingenstaff from Glasgow Middle School. And my question is, um, are we going to bring Germany's higher education standards to this country? Oh, wow. Are we going to bring Germany's <laughs> higher education standards uh, to this country? Wow. Uh, th this, is a, this is a young man who listened uh, to the uh, President's State of the Union speech last night. <laughs> Any of the panelists want to take that on? If not, I'll do it. <laughs> it's all you, John. I mean, the short answer is, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a different country, uh, uh, different circumstances. I don't know that we will import Germany's approach exactly, but we are completely committed to lifting our game in education broadly in this country and in STEM education in particular. The president has said repeatedly, that the single most important thing we can do for the future of our country is to lift our game in STEM education. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, we're doing well, but we need to do better. The world is getting more uh, competitive uh, all the time. Uh, we need uh, to maintain our edge in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we aim to develop the initiatives and the standards and the monitoring uh, and the follow-up uh, and the inspiration that will help us do it. And one of the things that today's event about is about is about uh, inspiration. Science is uh, a lot of preparation. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. But it's also all about inspiration, about being excited about the opportunities. Uh, next question. OK, well, now we're getting some action over here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lewis Campbell from Kimmore Middle School. And I would not like to ask Ms. Garver, what it is NASA's future in artificial intelligence. Lewis, thanks for asking the question. Uh, 
NASA has driven technologies across the board in all areas, represented most recently, of course, by, by Curiosity. And we explore with robots that have certainly uh, artificial intelligence in the sense that we are not physically present with uh, a lot of these explorers as they go out, not on only into our solar system, but beyond. But as we drive these technologies and be able to, I think, marry both the science of IT and biology, and a lot of the people represented on this panel really uh, are doing that every day. Uh, we will be able to, I, I think, make advances that will benefit us right here at home. Okay, the next one. Hey, there's one right in the second row on the edge there. Hello, my name is Ruben DeBester from uh, Wilson High School. My question is, well, first of all, I just want to say that I deeply admire all the great work that NASA has been doing, Curiosity Rover, absolutely fantastic. All that was really crazy. I loved following that. But as we, as we get on, we see that more and more private companies are beginning to go into the field of space exploration. SpaceX, the most famous one, flew the, flew the Dragon capsule up to the space station. Virgin Galactic uh, is doing test flights for space tourism. So how will NASA work with these new private comp uh, companies and how will that impact the future of space flight? It's a great question also. NASA has always worked with the private sector. About 80% of what we do is spent with the private sector. So we have 18,000 employees ourselves, but we have contractors uh, four times that many. In fact, Bobek is actually a contractor, not a NASA uh, civil servant. And so partnering in new ways with the private sector, that is another way we drive innovation. And we are looking with companies like SpaceX and Sierra Nevada and Boeing to take our astronauts to the space station again at a fraction of the cost that we could do it if we were just uh, paying directly with the government. So probably some of you would like to go to space in your lifetimes maybe, and you might not actually all work for the government. So the idea is we can buy a seat. <laughs> But they can also sell seats to a lot of other people, and that'll reduce the cost and allow NASA to invest in those things that we do best, which is exploring, driving uh, the frontier outward and doing things going beyond, as Dr. Holdren said, that than we've been before to an asteroid and on to Mars. Bob Beck, you want to add something to that? No, I mean, I totally agree, actually. I think that that's one of the great things about the whole commercialization of this is that we now have the opportunity to re kind of refocus our efforts on the things that we do do best and those things that hopefully excite some of you guys. Definitely excite me. This is why I, I work at NASA. So, um, no, I'm, I, think it's, I think it's an awesome time for, for all of us. Okay, the next one, there's a woman on the edge of the third row. Um, oh, I'm Jania Farrell, and I go to Saunders Middle School. Um, has Curiosity found anything on Mars besides water? <laughs> <laughs> That's one for Bob back, I think. <laughs> so uh, we're, you know, we're sort of still very early on. It's about six months in, of course, in, the, in a mission that will be uh, two, two plus years. I mean, we're hoping for a decade or more. Uh, so it's, it's kind of early to say what we found and what we haven't. What, what I think what we found so far is a lot of the things that we had kind of hypothesized about Mars, we're sort of, you know, we're finding out now are, are actually true, so with our ground evidence. Uh, but we just did a first drill on Mars within the last week. And, uh, and that's actually kind of the, the real cool part about this mission is we're actually going to get into the history of Mars, not just the surface of Mars. It's been, you know, it has radiation and weathering and everything else. We're actually going to see that, that preserved Martian history. And I think that's when the really cool stuff is actually going to start showing up. So give us, a, give us another couple of weeks so we can actually take that sample in and analyze it and everything else. But, but I think it'll be really cool. Great. Uh, we got to get some, uh, oh, we're really missing the back. We have a whole bunch of questions in the back. Let's go back there for a while because we've had the uh, right side of the room has been uh, very well represented so far. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Kelly and I go to Thomas Jefferson High School. Um, this is in respect to foreign language. Given the collaborative nature of science, technology, and innovation, how can we better prepare students and especially high school students um, for research and collaboration on a global level? Wow, that's, that, that is a, a great question. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll well, start. Bob yeah. can, can start as, well, as one of our multilingual uh, experts. I, I, yeah. um, no, I, I will say that you know, even within our, our mission, Curiosity, which is a very small example of this, but you know, we have instruments contributed by so many different countries. Um, Russia, Spain, France, uh, Canada, to name a few. Uh, 
so obviously a variety of languages, I mean, we tend to, of course, converse mostly in English, but I think the whole nature of what we're doing is totally going to be increasingly international, certainly for space exploration and probably for a lot of the bigger challenges that, as a globe, we're going to face. Um, so I think it's really important to actually focus it. I mean, I, I had the good fortune, I guess, of growing up in a multilingual household and, and living overseas for a while. Um, but, you know, I would love to see that, of course, more in schools as well to, to see, you know, a greater emphasis on, on that. And I think it just, you know, and for me personally, I think it kind of helps you just approach problems in a different way. Sometimes just knowing a different culture and a different language kind of helps you see things from, uh, in a really different way. And that's actually a really powerful thing for, for STEM stuff too because you want to be able to approach problems or even just understand where another person is coming from when the, in their approach to a problem. I would just add to that, uh, obviously learning a language can be hard. Some languages are harder than others. Uh, Chinese is going to be a very important language for the future of our cooperation in science. It's, it's a tough language uh, for native English speakers to master, but it's worth it. You know, it is famously noted that there are more teachers of English in China than there are speakers of Chinese in the United States. And that is a ratio that we would do well to repair. Uh, next question, where are we? Where, where did the microphone go? We've got it back there. Okay, why don't you just uh, work around in there? Hello, I come from Swanson Middle School, and first of all, I'd just like to say, Mr. Bobak, your, your mohawks are really cool. <laughs> Thank you. And Ms. Graver, my question for you is, how long did it take to get to your current status? <laughs> uh, well, I just, in fact, went home last weekend and talked at my high school where I was 35 years ago. So that's how long it took from when I was your age. Uh, you can do the math. <laughs> uh, and I really feel that uh, it is, as, as really Todd Park said, uh, growing up and asking a lot of questions. And being able to make discoveries is what exploration is all about, being able to uh, learn things that we have not learned before that will benefit humanity and society and advance our civilization. And NASA is a place from the vantage point of space where we can do that. So for me, uh, it was a very exciting path uh, that I've taken over the last 35 years. But I have, I really want to dye my hair different colors for this <laughs> press conference and they thought that would not be my best play. <laughs> All right, where's the mic? Okay, we have uh, a question here in the last row before the wall. Hello, my name is Anna Voiles from James Madison High School. And uh, here in the US, the liberal arts are very valued in our uh, education system. But some educators have recently been making a push for a more STEM-based curriculum across America. So how does the Obama administration stand on that issue? And also, how do you guys feel about it? Well, I guess uh, I, better, I better start uh, with this answer in any case. Uh, the Obama administration uh, certainly recognizes that the humanities and the arts uh, are important focuses uh, in our education system. Uh, the social sciences, the natural sciences, engineering, math, uh, are all important focuses. And our view is that people should pursue the focuses or the combination of focuses that most excite and inspire them and lift them to be interested in their work, uh, to do their best work, to make their best contribution to society. Uh, our focus on STEM has not been motivated by the view that the humanities are less important or the arts are less important um, or, uh, or, or, or within STEM fields that one uh, particular discipline is more important than another, but rather that in the competitive world in which we now live, we have been noticing that we need to do a better job with STEM education. That this is a domain where too many kids who start out interested in STEM fields uh, lose interest uh, for, uh, for reasons that are fixable. Uh, either uh, the teaching is not up to snuff, uh, there are too many lectures and too little hands-on experience, uh, too little exposure to the excitement and the inspiration of science and math and engineering. Uh, we don't want everyone to be uh, in a STEM field, but we want all those who have the interest in being in a STEM field be able to realize their aspirations in that domain, and that requires a higher level of, uh, of STEM teaching, uh, of STEM education, than uh, we have managed to achieve uh, on a national basis. Uh, there are many pockets of excellence, of course. We want to replicate and propagate those. 
but we also want to replicate and propagate uh, the excellence uh, in the humanities and the arts that characterize our educational system. Let's, uh, where is the microphone these days? Okay, so let's do some more down here. Let's go right in the front row. My name is Ritesh Roman. I come from Southwest Academy Middle School. Um, I'm really fascinated in the field of science and technology. So how does America differ from high-tech places such as Tokyo and Japan and technology? Anyone? Hey, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I, th I think there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of commonality, of course, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, how folks all over the world are pursuing uh, science and tech. Um, I actually think um, that one thing that really distinguishes America is that we take a very uniquely entrepreneurial approach uh, to the use of science and, and tech. Um, so I'm actually a private sector tech entrepreneur by background before I actually joined the government. Um, and Pete is an entrepreneur as well. And I think that in America, uh, you are seeing the most creative uses of science and tech uh, to advance the public good, improve lives of Americans, and create jobs. Uh, and Pete actually should tell you his story, uh, maybe uh, either during this or afterwards, just to kind of illustrate that. Um, but one of the misconceptions, I think, about, about STEM um, is that uh, you know, it, it's actually not artistic. Um, actually, I don't think that that's true at all. I think that actually writing a great computer program uh, or inventing a great new machine has a lot more in common with writing a great novel or making a movie than it is sort of a colored by numbers exercise. And so I think actually the, the greatest practitioners of STEM, the ones that contributed most to society, are actually great artistic minds, are great entrepreneurial minds, right? If they, if they can think boldly, think creatively, think out of the box. And I think, not that I'm biased, but I think a disproportionate number of those minds and hearts and souls are here in the United States of America. I think that actually there are a great number of those souls here in the audience, and uh, I'm really eager to see what you're going to do. Peter, do you want to add uh, anything to that? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, I think um, being an entrepreneur means that there's really no roadmap. There's nothing that's going to tell you what your next step is. You just have to figure it out. So having that creativity, um, you know, both Lori and I went to a liberal arts college. Um, we learned to ask why. Uh, I took Russian literature, and I took uh, pre-med. So um, uh, I learned a lot, of, uh, <clears throat> a, a lot of the humanities, but I also had a really good science background. And so when we, uh, when we started iTriage and when I um, uh, started other companies, um, it, it, it always begins with a big question. So how do you make, um, how do you solve a very big problem? And, uh, and how do you get started doing that? And, and, and then the, the questions keep flowing after that. And I think having the diligence to uh, continue to ask those questions and keep trying to make things better and uh, inventing along the way is uh, is how you know new business starts and how technology gets supplied in ways that can really make a difference for society and for, and for people in general. Good. Uh, let's see. We have a couple in the second row in this uh, section that we ought to hit. Then we'll come back over to the to the. Uh, Hello, I'm Alec Brenner from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. Once again, a heartfelt congratulations for the success of landing MSL Curiosity, at least half of which must have been due to Mr. Fredowski's amazing hairdo. Uh, in light of that success, what are NASA's next priorities for space exploration beyond MSL and current space missions? Nick, go ahead. So NASA is driving uh, to explore beyond uh, the moon's orbit, as uh, Dr. Holden said, to an asteroid as our next human destination. Right now, with the shuttle retirement, we are uh, really focused on the International Space Station as our foothold to the universe. Six astronauts and cosmonauts from four different countries are orbiting overhead as we speak. We have been doing that consistently for 12 years. Just within the last year, 400 scientific experiments on the International Space Station. Astronauts are learning to live and work in space for those exploration missions to go beyond, again, ultimately, uh, to Mars. So uh, Mars Curiosity and the rover we announced that will happen again in 2020 are precursor explorers to people like you who will be able to explore. We also study a lot of other scientific um, advancements from the unique vantage point of space, Earth science right now. We had a launch uh, day before yesterday, which uh, will be our 
17th operational spacecraft looking down at Earth, understanding this great planet. The president talked about that last night. The importance of uh, being able to protect our planet depends on having the best information. So we are explorers out as well as uh, back here on Earth. I'm going to break protocol for just a second. I'm going to ask Jack Andreka a question that I'm astonished no one in the audience has asked him yet, which is how, how did you come to be interested at such an early age in such an esoteric field as cancer detection? So I actually became interested in pancreatic cancer specifically because a close family friend who was like an uncle passed from the disease. And then what I did is I just used Google and Wikipedia and I found that the current standard of pancreatic cancer detection is really lacking. Each test costs about $800 and misses 30% of all cancers. And so I was like, I have to do something about this. And so I just used Google and Wikipedia and came up with this idea to do pancreatic cancer. And so really, um, my big thing is using the internet for different things and seeing that you don't have to take duck face pictures of yourself or take pictures of your food and post them on Instagram. <laughs> Instead, you could be using it to change the world. At the beginning of this, I didn't even know I had a pancreas. And so just imagine what you could do. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's get over to this side again. But anyone who asked a question before, I see one young man with his hand up who already had one question. Nobody's going to get two. We're not going to call on you again. Over, over here in the second row. Hi, my name is Deborah Secular, and I go to school without walls. Um, I know earlier you were talking about the intersection of climate and energy. And I know recently other countries have started implementing carbon taxes or cap and trade schemes. And I was wondering if you think a similar measure would have value in the United States and what the political likelihood of that happening would be. Well, we know after the, uh, after the first two years of the Obama presidency, uh, when an attempt to get a comprehensive uh, climate change policy, which would have included a cap and trade scheme through the Congress failed, uh, it became clear at that point that the best levers uh, against the climate change challenge that were available to the administration were things that could be done through uh, authorities of uh, executive branch agencies that already existed. And so the focus has largely been on strengthening fuel economy standards, on encouraging a transition from coal to natural gas and renewable electricity generation, uh, to uh, providing uh, incentives uh, to companies to invest more in uh, clean energy innovation, energy efficiency innovation. Uh, the President has now, in both his inaugural address and his State of the Union address last night, uh, called on the Congress uh, once more uh, to take action, but he's made clear if the Congress does not take action, uh, he will continue uh, to act with the executive authorities available to him. And I think, uh, I hope the Congress uh, will take a more comprehensive approach, uh, but I'm uh, not a political odds maker. And I'm just a science advisor. In fact, when I get into political odds making, occasionally people sometimes remind me, Holdren, you're just a science advisor, leave the politics to us. So I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to give odds on what we're going to get uh, out of the Congress, but I will give odds that there will be a wide array of, uh, of measures that the administration will embrace that will advance the ball uh, on the climate change challenge. And by the way, many of these measures uh, will create jobs and drive economic growth as well, and they will position the United States to be uh, an effective competitor in the global market for technologies that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Let's see, where's our mic? Okay, let's go right there. You're in a good position. Uh, hi, my name is Kayuri, and I'm from Thomas Jefferson High School. Um, my question is that how are you guys um, planning on or what has the administration proposed in order to encourage more research um, past just, I guess, the high school level, but also in college and other um, initiatives that are going to encourage kids to keep going with research um, and make that part of the uh, daily system? Okay, that, that, that's another uh, big question. We keep trying to keep our answers to two minutes, but we are, uh, first of all, uh, we are doing everything we can in a difficult budget environment to protect the federal government's investments in uh, research and development. Uh, the federal government is the biggest supporter of basic research, fundamental research, whose outcome cannot be known and whose gain 
to society cannot be uh, predicted, uh, for the obvious reason that the private sector uh, likes to invest in things where they have the potential of an economic return. But it's important to remember that the private sector pays for about 70% of all the research that's done in this country, and they do uh, about two-thirds of it. And as a result, it's not enough for the federal government to maintain or increase, if possible, its own support for research and development. It's important to create an environment that encourages the private sector to continue and expand these investments. And so we've been working to make the research and experimentation tax credit bigger, simpler, and permanent. We've been working to create an environment around patents, around uh, the use of uh, uh, free access to government data, which Todd uh, leads, uh, and a variety of other measures to make this an innovation-friendly society where the private sector will continue to do its part in the jobs and opportunities that are created there in uh, science, technology, engineering, and math will also continue to grow. And just to add, uh, add uh, a plug for the data part, um, <laughs> as being the data geek that I am, uh, you know, a, a key prerequisite to a lot of research is obviously having access to data. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, the administration is doing under the leadership of the president is championing the whole idea of actually making more and more data in the vaults of the government uh, available in machine readable form to anybody for free. Um, so you can actually pick it up and use it to build companies uh, like Pete has, or pick it up and actually use it to power new scientific discoveries. And so everyone here in this audience has access now to a massive treasure trove of US government data that you actually, well, your parents paid for, <laughs> and that we're giving back to them and to you. So if you go to data.gov, uh, it's got just an extraordinary array of incredible data resources and can power research at really every level. Uh, and actually beyond research can actually power development of innovative new products and services and companies like Pete's that have actually created 90 jobs in Denver, uh, saving lots of lives, improving access to healthcare for all. So check it out, data.gov. It's your data. You should use it to create awesomeness on an epic scale. The, uh, the one further thing I'll mention here is our grand challenges uh, effort. I mentioned in my opening remarks the importance of grand challenges. Grand challenges are things like uh, making solar energy cheaper than coal figuring out how we would deflect an asteroid if one turned out to be on a collision course uh, with the Earth, uh, making, making batteries that uh, store 10 times as much energy as today's batteries and make electric cars uh, really, really attractive. Uh, we have a whole Grand Challenges program in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, headed by Kristen Dorgalo, who's standing there in the back. Uh, and the focus of that effort is to use grand challenges across the public sector, across the private sector, across the academic sector to create more opportunities for people, including young people, to get excited about and contribute to the ways in which science and technology can solve these enormously important problems. Um, all right, next question. Let's see here. What part of the room have we been missing? Sort of the back on that side we've been missing. Let's go over there. Uh, hello, my name is Damani Eubanks from Charles River Flowers High School, and my question is, um, with the sequester and other budget cuts, how do you think that'll affect STEM research or um, education in STEM fields? Gee. <laughs> <laughs> Too, too many of these questions are being lobbed into my court. <laughs> Some of them uh, have uh, burning fuses on them. Uh, number one, uh, we are doing our best uh, to avoid the sequester uh, and uh, very much uh, hope that it can be avoided with the cooperation of the Congress and that we won't have uh, the meat ax cuts uh, to all of our programs, both defense programs and uh, civilian programs and including research and development. Uh, those cuts, if they happen, uh, will be devastating. Uh, they'll be devastating across the science agencies, whether it be NASA or the National Institutes of Health or the Department of Energy Science Office or the National Science Foundation. They're going to be devastating, and they're going to be harmful to the economy. They're going to be harmful to employment. So the job one is to avoid uh, that happening at all. Uh, the president has made very clear, he made it clear again last night in his State of the Union speech, that cuts uh, that affect education, cuts that affect our investments in science and technology, are cuts that are undermining the future uh, of the country. We ought not to be doing that. It's not uh, a sensible policy. 
uh, if uh, against all reason the sequester occurs, we obviously will do our best to minimize uh, the impact of the cuts that occur and to minimize their duration uh, in terms of their effect uh, on our research and development enterprise and on our STEM education enterprise. All right, let's uh, go a little further back on that side because I don't think we got that part uh, well represented yet. Hello, I'm Leila Nasser and I'm representing Girl Scouts. So my question is, is what is the administration doing to encourage more girls to get involved in the STEM field? Aha, uh -huh. Th this, uh, this is actually a great topic. We have a White House Council on Women and Girls that's headed by Tina Chen, who is also uh, the Chief of Staff uh, to the First Lady. And uh, OSTP, in fact, is working very closely uh, with the White House Council on Women and Girls. In fact, uh, our uh, lead person responsible for that is also in the room, Lauren Anderson, who's in the back corner. We've had a wide variety of events uh, around uh, improving opportunities uh, and inspiration for women and girls in STEM fields. Uh, the NSF uh, launched uh, more than a year ago a major initiative making uh, the conditions of work better uh, for uh, women in science fields who have uh, NSF grants. Uh, we have brought a wide variety of leading women scientists and engineers into the White House to inspire audiences uh, like this one with what they've been able to do and they've been able to achieve and with their ideas about how to improve uh, access, opportunity, and quality of professional life for women and girls in this domain. So this is really uh, a, favorite, uh, a favorite theme uh, uh, here in the White House, one that's very important to the President, very important to the First Lady, and very important uh, to those of us who work with them. And I'll just add, because we happen to have the head of the NASA uh, STEM um, Council on Women and Girls in the room too, to Rebecca Spike Kaiser is the director of the NASA program, and she is here with her daughter, Sydney. Sydney, I'm going to give you a, a shout out as well. At NASA, this is because I only have sons, it's not fair. <laughs> Get to adopt Sydney every now and then. Um, this really is a priority. Even at NASA, we have a, a quarter of our STEM workforce is female. And as I like to point out, are we a quarter of the population? No, no. Uh, we have more work to do. Uh, we have uh, within this program and the incredible leadership of the White House, Valerie Jarrett and um, the First Lady, I've uh, been working to, as Dr. Holdren said, put an emphasis on it in the way that as we give grants, being more aware, being able to identify role models, and we have a website I would encourage you to go to at NASA Council on Women and Girls. Thanks. Great. Uh, okay. We have uh, some back row from the right side of the room. Hi, I'm Juliana Bain. I go to Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. And I'm Lucy Benzinger from HB Woodlawn High School. We have a question for Jack. How did you test the effectiveness of your pancreas cancer like, sensor? And, uh, and after your research, how did you even get started um, with coming up with your cancer test? So um, essentially what I did for, um, after I created the sensor, that actually took me quite a long time. It took me five months like over like my deadline. So, but in order to, test the effectiveness of the sensor, essentially what you do is first you test mouse samples, and so they have pancreatic cancer samples in them, and so they have the mesothelone protein, which is the cancer biomarker I was looking for, already circulating in their blood, and so essentially I took blood samples and I tested them, and it just requires a sixth of a drop of blood, so it was extremely non-invasive to the mice. For all of you animal activists out there, they didn't feel that much pain. <laughs> And then, um, so after I did my research, essentially what happened is I actually did all my research from my house, like on the background research, and then I wrote an email, actually 200 emails, to the National Institutes of um, Health, and then also the uh, Johns Hopkins University, and out of those, I got 199 rejections, and one lukewarm maybe, and I actually had to go through three months of phone tag with the professor to get into his lab. But eventually I did, and seven months later I had one small paper sensor that had 100% accuracy. Wow. <laughs> a 
Okay, we have time for two more. I'm, I'm going to apologize preemptively to those who missed. There's a gentleman in the second row here who's going to get one of them, and then the woman in the third will get the young woman in the third will get the other. My name is Vincent DePerna from Glasgow Middle School. And do you think that we should have solar panels on the highest buildings in downtown areas required? <laughs> Question, should we have solar panels on the highest buildings? Um, well, I think we should have solar panels everywhere that they're economical. And uh, again, we've been making great progress. Solar panels have been getting less expensive. Uh, if we just project current trends, uh, they will become uh, less expensive uh, than fossil fuels before long. And I think we will see solar panels on a lot more buildings, uh, tall ones, short ones, medium-sized ones, and also in arrays uh, in, uh, of large area in, in other places. There's a big future uh, for solar energy in this country. Now in the, the young woman in the third row. Hi, Dr. Holder. My name is Thersha Potlary from Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. Um, I talked to you earlier this year when you visited our school, and um, we took a tour around the school facilities, and you visited our energy systems lab. And um, we have a project where we're launching a satellite with, um, in collaboration with NASA, actually, later this year. Um, and then later in your keynote speech, you mentioned um, increased collaboration between the government and high school students. And so we were one. Uh, my question was, um, with uh, President Obama's second term, uh, how is the Obama administration working to increase this collaboration between students and the government? Well, that's actually a great question. Obviously, we're very early uh, in the second term, and we're having a lot of conversations about how we're going to use uh, the opportunity of uh, another four years of the Obama administration to advance the ball in all these STEM fields, and that will certainly include uh, working uh, with high school and with middle school students. I think we'll be seeing uh, more science fairs. We'll be seeing more efforts to find ways to get uh, high school students, certainly, and maybe middle school students involved uh, in uh, real-world uh, research problems. Uh, I think uh, some of the efforts that have been uh, mentioned already in terms of uh, how we get uh, more women and girls uh, interested in and involved in science are going to certainly be pushed forward uh, very hard in this, uh, in this administration. But uh, we're really uh, not done uh, think thinking about this. And uh, I think you have my email address. I will welcome your further thoughts about, uh, about what we might be doing that we're not. I'll give you one specific example as well. We're expanding, certainly, in the second term, a program where you can online, high school students, put forward experiments that the winners will be flown on the International Space Station. We just closed one round, but we'll be expanding it. And that is a program that is sponsored by the private sector. Uh, so it's a, it's a great partnership opportunity, and we'll be expanding those. And I'm hoping that the uh, achievements like those of Jack Andreka and other uh, young people who've made astonishing contributions uh, to science and technology at an early age will lead to a situation that when one of you sends out 200 emails asking for access, <laughs> that you'll get more than one uh, tentative lukewarm acceptance. Uh, maybe 100 acceptances would be an appropriate, uh, an appropriate ratio. So uh, again, inspiration is part of this, and inspiration works two ways. Uh, we hope uh, that the success of uh, Folks like the folks at the table here will inspire you, but I also want you to know that you inspire us, and your ideas and your energy uh, are one of the reasons we have uh, such high hopes for the future. So with that, let me uh, thank you all again uh, for uh, being here. Uh, let me thank uh, Bess Evans and all of her uh, team, uh, our folks in the Office of Public Engagement and our folks in OSTP who made this uh, event uh, possible. But above all, uh, thanks to you young people and your teachers, your mentors, and your parents, uh, because you are the future. And I, and I should have thanked our extraordinary panel for devoting their time uh, to uh, answering these amazingly perceptive questions.